This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. My job tonight is to introduce all our participants, and I'm going to start with Dave Dewar, who is the Director of Development and External Relations here at the library, and who, along with Bob Haas, was one of the people who was responsible for the founding of this series, Story Hour. So it's appropriate we begin this episode about beginnings with Dave, who, who begat Story Hour. <laughs> He's a Berkeley graduate, class of 68. He got an MS from USC and then spent a few years teaching. Um, including a period teaching and traveling in Zambia. And then I guess that changed him because when he came back, he moved into development and came to Cal to get involved in fundraising, first for engineering, then for health systems, and since 2000 here at the library. Please welcome Dave Dewar. In your seats, there is a nice little item. It's. Uh, could be construed as a bookmark since we're in a library, but it talks about the Doe Centennial. We are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the dedication of the Doe Library this coming March. It was dedicated on Charter Day in March of 1912, a uh, time that was very interesting around here, six years after the earthquake and fire in San Francisco. Um, there is a website. You can check it out. There will be activities, and I encourage you to uh, look into the things that are going on in the library as we celebrate 100 years. Uh, the first segment of that is already, it's an exhibit on the 100th anniversary of the passage of women's suffrage in California in 1911, and there's an exhibit up in the hallway between the Bancroft Library and this library, so you should check that out. But as Vikram said, this uh, title is Beginnings, and the idea of beginnings is the start of any book, prose, short story, anything that, that suits our readers tonight. And I'm gonna help start this by putting something out there that Vikram feels very strongly about. We have to get into crime fiction right away, so. <clears throat> I, I, I will take on that mantle, being somebody who has gotten immersed in this over the last few years. Um, I'm going to read from James Crumley and uh, a little introduction, because probably you don't know James Crumley. Um, September 17, 2008, John Shulian wanted to know if I'd heard the news. Uh, I, John's a friend. I hadn't. His email message filled me in. James Crumley, the best crime writer of our generation, died at 68 in a bed surrounded by his friends and family in Missoula. I never pictured him checking out so benignly, and I doubt he did either. The train to glory left without James Crumley, who seems to have been too busy examining life's gnarly side to bother catching it. There are no bestsellers for him, no money-bloated deals with Hollywood, just hard-boiled novels that are better than anybody else's because all those lost nights stashed in the margins make each one a survivor's story. Crumley has never shot a man in Reno just to watch him die, but he knows how blood looks when it's spilled against a backdrop of whiskey dons, cocaine pick-me-ups, and wall-shaking sex. His is a wisdom acquired by belling up to the bar in road houses where bikers, ranch hands, and oil field workers beat each other senseless for putting the wrong Merle Haggard song on the jukebox. It's no life for the delicate, but the delicate don't have a taste for Crumley's novels anyway, so the hell with them. It's hard to say what's driving him. Maybe he feels the dog's immortality nipping at his heels. Maybe he has decided to get the most out of his vast talent. Not that he's ever given the impression of someone burdened by regret. He did, however, apologize the day he showed up 10 minutes late for a writer's panel on which he was the cult hero. I lost my watch, he said. Uh, any idea where, asked an unsuspecting straight man. Yeah, Crumley said. I threw it out a car window in El Paso in 1978. <laughs> James Crumley, Hot Springs. At night, even in the chill mountain air, Mona Sue insisted on cranking the air conditioner all the way up 
Her usual temperature always ran a couple of degrees higher than normal, and she claimed that the baby she carried made her constant fever even worse. She kept the cabin cold enough to hang meat. During the long, sleepless nights, Benbo spooned to her naked, burning skin, trying to stay warm. In the mornings, too, Monasu forced him into the cold. The modern cabin sat on a bench in the cool shadow of Mount Nehart, and they broke their fast with a room service breakfast on the deck, a robe wrapped loosely around her naked body while Benbo bundled into both sweats and a robe. Mona Sue ate with the precise and delicate greed of a heart surgeon, the pad of her spatulate thumb white on the handle of her spoon as she carved a perfect curled ball from the soft orange meat of her melon. Each bite of the meat had to be balanced with an equal weight of toast before being crushed between her tiny white teeth. Then she examined each strawberry poised before her darkly red lips as if it might be a jewel of great omen and she some ancient oracle. Then she sank her shining teeth into the fleshy fruit as if it were the mortal truth. Benbow's heart rolled in his chest as he tried to fill his lungs with the cold air to fight off the heat of her body. Fall had come to the mountains now. The cottonwood and alders welcomed the change with garish morning dress. And in the mornings, a rime of ice covered the windshield of the gray Taurus he'd stolen at the Denver airport. New snow fell each night, moving slowly down the ridges from the high distant peaks of the Hard Rock Range and slipped closer each morning down the steep ridge behind them. Below the bench, the old lodge seemed to settle more deeply into the narrow canyon, as if hunkering down for eons of snow and the steam from the hot springs mixed with the wood smoke and lay flat and sinuous along the yellow creek willows. Benbow suspected, too, that the scenery was wasted on Mona Sue. Her dark eyes seemed turned inward to a dreamscape of her life. Her husband, R. L. Dark, the pig farmer, his bull-neck son, little R. L., and the lumpy Ozark offal of her large, worthless family. Coach, she'd say. She thought it was funny to call him coach, interrupting the shattered and drifting narrative of her dreams. And she'd sweep back into the thick black Indian hair from her face, tilt her narrow head on the slender column of her neck, and laugh. Coach, that old R.L., he's a coming. You stole something belonged to him, and you can bet he's on his way. Little R.L., too. Probably because he told me once he'd like to string your guts on a bob wire fence. She recited like a sprightly but not very bright child. Sweetheart, R.L. Dark can just barely cipher the numbers on a dollar bill or the spots on a card, Benbow answered, as he had each morning for the six months they'd been on the run. He can't read a map that he hasn't drawn himself, and by noon he's too drunk to fit his ass on a tractor seat and find his hog pens. You know, Puddin, an old boy's got enough of them dollar bills or stacks of them Franklins like we do, she added, laughing. He can hire out that reading part and the map part, too. So he's a coming. You can put that in your mama's piggy bank. This was a new wrinkle in their morning ritual, and Benbo caught himself glancing down at the parking lot behind the lodge and shook at the narrow and look at the single narrow road coming up Hidden Springs Canyon. But he shook it off quickly, and he made the fateful decision to take Mona Sue and the money and go for it, never glancing over his shoulder, living in the moment. While Mona Sue had swelled through the pregnancy, Benbo had shed 27 pounds from his blocky frame. Sometimes, just after they made love, it seemed as if her burning body had stolen the baby from his own muscled flesh, something stolen during the tangle of love, something growing hard and tight in her smooth, slim body. As usual, they made love, then finished coffee, ordered a fresh pot, tipped the wrangler, made love again before her morning nap. While Mona Sue slept, usually Benbow would drink the rest of the coffee as he read the day-old Merriweather newspaper and then slip into his sweats and running shoes and jog down the switchbacks to the lodge to laze in the hot waters of the pools. He loved it there, floating in the water that seemed heavier than normal, thicker, cleaner, clearer. He almost felt whole there, cleansed and healthy and warm, taking the waters like some rich foreign prince fleeing his failed life. Occasionally, Benbo wished Mona Sue would interrupt her naps to join him, but she always said it might hurt the baby, and he already had plenty hot with her natural fevers. 
As the weeks passed, uh, Benbo learned to treasure his time alone in the hot pool and stopped asking her. So their days wound away routinely, spooling like silk ribbons through their fingers, as placid as the deeply still waters of the pool. But this noon, exhausted from the run and the worry, the lack of sleep and food, Benbo slipped effort effortlessly into the heated gravity of Mona Sue's sleeping body and slept, only to wake suddenly, sweating in spite of the chill when the air conditioner was switched off. R. L. Dark stood at the foot of their bed, grinning. The old man stretched his crinkled neck, sniffing the air like an ancient snapping turtle, testing the air for food or fun, since he had no natural enemies except for teenage boys with 22s. R. Hell had dressed for the occasion. He wore a new car hat tin coat, clean bib overalls with the old Webley 455 revolver hanging on a string from his neck and bag in the bib pocket. Two good old boys flanked him, one bald and the other wildly hirsute, both huge and dressed in Kmart flannel plaid. The bald one held up a small ball peen hammer like a trophy. They weren't grinning. A skinny man in a baggy white suit shifted from foot to foot behind them, smiling weakly like a gun-shy pointer pup. Well, piss on the fire, boys, and call the dogs, R.L. Dark said, hustling the extra four, five, five rounds in his pocket as if they were his withered privates. This hunt's done. Thank you, Dave. Um, if you haven't read Crumley, you must. There's an alcoholic bulldog that you will never forget. <laughs> uh, Tony Cascardi is our new Dean of Arts and Humanities. Um, he took over in July of this year. Prior to that, he directed the Townsend Center. His interests are broad. They include comparative literature, Spanish, Portuguese, and rhetoric. He has served as the chair of the comparative literature and rhetoric departments. He has written extensively on figures such as Cervantes and Goya, and on issues of philosophy and aesthetics in art and literature. I give you Tony. Thank you very much, um, Victor, Vikram. It's a, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, Dave's remarks earlier reminded me of a conversation that I had. Actually, it was a meeting that Bob Haas requested when I was at the uh, Townsend Center. And he came to me to say, what did I think of the idea about a story hour? at the library, and so, of course, those conversations are never without some consequences, so <laughs> here we are. No, it's really, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, in thinking about um, what to read, I had uh, two, two different strands of thought that eventually came together. Uh, one had to do with questions about memory, uh, in part because some of the things I've been involved with with one, with one hand have to do with what people are calling the digital humanities. And in and around that, there are lots of questions that are being raised about memory and what digital devices are doing to our memories and a fear of loss of memory and are we sort of abdicating our memories and depositing it in these, uh, these remote uh, devices. Of course, the, the question of what devices and technologies of all kinds due to our memories is a very, very uh, old one. Uh, so that was one strand of thought. And the other um, was prompted by the fact that this year, all the freshmen at Berkeley are converging around uh, a topic and a set of readings and discussions that have to do with language and languages. And I think the rubric, if I, if I don't have it uh, wrong, is Voices of Berkeley. So I wanted to do something that would give some flavor of something multilingual or polyglot. Um, and the, the topic of languages at Berkeley uh, suggests that one comes to Berkeley with a, many students rather, we all come to Berkeley with a native language. For many students, it doesn't happen to be English. But I also wanted to reflect at the other languages that we bring uh, to Berkeley, and in my case, a second language, which is Spanish. So I converged on a story that was written by Jorge Luis Borges, in, uh, published in 1942. Um, one of my most favorite stories, the, the title in Spanish is Funes el Memorioso. And the published translation is something like Funes the Memorious. And Memorious is a very odd locution in English. And it's trying to capture something odd about the locution in Spanish. And it's trying to say that this is a memorable character 
but it also happens to be a man with a prodigious memory. And so you might say, Funes, the man with the prodigious memory, whom we cannot forget. Hence, so what I want to do is a bit of a kind of uh, a reading that will volley back and forth a bit between the English and the Spanish. I remember him, lo recuerdo. I scarcely have the right to use this ghostly verb. Only one man on earth deserved the right, and he is dead. Yo no tengo derecho a pronunciar ese verbo sagrado. Solo un hombre en la tierra tuvo derecho, y ese hombre muerto. I remember him with a dark passion flower in his hand, looking at it as no one has ever looked at such a flower, though they might look from the twilight of day until the twilight of night for a whole life long. Lo, re lo recuerdo con una oscura, pa una oscura pasionaria en la mano, viéndola como nadie la ha visto, aunque la mirara desde el crepúsculo del día hasta el de la noche, toda una vida entera. I remember him, his face immobile and Indian-like, singularly remote behind his cigarette. Lo recuerdo, la cara taciturna y aindiada, y singularmente remota detrás del cigarillo. I remember, I believe, the strong and delicate fingers of the plainsman who can braid leather. I remember near those hands a vessel in which to make mate tea, bearing the insignia of the Banda Oriental. I remember in the window of the house a yellow rush mat, and beyond a vague marshy landscape. I remember clearly his voice, the deliberate, resentful nasal voice of the old East Shore man without those Italianate syllables of today. Recuerdo, creo, sus manos afiladas del trenzador. Recuerdo cerca de esas manos una, un mate con las armas de la banda oriental. Recuerdo en la ventana de la casa una estera amarilla con un vago paisaje lacustre. Recuerdo claramente su voz, la voz pausada, resentida y nasal del, del orillero antiguo, sin los silbidos italianos de ahora. I did not see him more than three times, the last in 1887. Más de tres veces no lo vi, la última en 1887. That all those who knew him should write something about him seems to me a happy idea. My testimony may perhaps be the briefest and without doubt the poorest, and it will not be the, at the least impartial. The deplorable fact of my being an Argentinian will hinder me from falling into a dithyram an obligatory form in Uruguay, when the theme is Uruguayan. Literatur, literatur slicker buenos arian, literato cajetilla porteño. Funes did not use these insulting phrases, but I am sufficiently aware that for him, I represented those unfortunate categories. Pedro Leandro Ipuche has written that Funes was a precursor of the Superman, an untamed and vernacular Zarathustra, un Zaratustra cimarrón y vernáculo. I do not doubt it, but one must not forget either that he was a countryman from the town of Fraibentos with certain incurable limitations. Mi primer recuerdo de Funes es, mi per, es muy perspicuo. Lo veo en un atardecer de marzo o febrero del año 84. My first recollection of Funes is quite clear. I see him at dusk, sometime in March or February of the year 84. Mi padre ese año me había llevado a veranear a Fraiventos. Yo volvía con mi primo Bernardo Aedo de la estancia de San Francisco. Volvíamos cantando a caballo y esa no era la única circunstancia de mi felicidad. Después de un día bochornoso, una enorme tormenta color pizarra había escondido el cielo. La alentaba el viento del sur y se enloquecían los, los árboles. Yo, tem, yo tenía el temor o la esperanza de que nos sorprendiera en un descampado el agua elemental. Corrimos una especie de carrera con la tormenta. Entramos en un callejón que se ahondaba entre las dos veredas altísimas de ladrillo. Había oscurecido de golpe. Oí rápidos y casi secretos pasos en lo, lo, lo alto. Alcé los ojos y vi un muchacho que corría por la estrecha y rota vereda como por una estrecha y rota pared. Recuerdo la bombacha, las albargatas, recuerdo el cigarrillo en el duro rostro contra el nubarrón ya sin límites. 
I was on my way back from, Fre Freben sorry, from the farm at San Francisco with my cousin Bernardo Aedo. We came back singing on horseback, and this last fact was not the only reason for my joy. After a sultry day, an enormous slate gray storm had obscured the sky. It was driven on by a wind from the south. The trees were already tossing like madmen, and I had the apprehension, or the hope, that the elemental downpour would catch us out in the open. We were running a kind of race with the tempest. We rode into a narrow lane which wound down between two enormously high brick footpaths. I had grown, it had, sorry, it had grown black of a sudden. I now heard rapid, almost secret steps above. I raised my eyes and saw a boy running along the narrow, cracked path as if he were running along a narrow, broken wall. I remember the loose trousers tight at the bottom, the hemp sandals. I remember the cigarette in the hand standing out against the, uh, against the by now limitless darkness. Bernardo unexpectedly yelled to him, what's the time, Ireneo? Que hora son, Ireneo? Without looking up, without stopping, Ireneo re replied, faltan cuatro minutos para las ocho, joven Bernardo Juan Francisco. Four minutes, in four minutes it will be eight o'clock, child Bernardo Juan Francisco. The voice was sharp and mocking. Now I have to fast forward um, uh, a bit for lack of, uh, of time, but the narrator uh, visits Funes, and what follows are two of the, I think, most inter interesting paragraphs of the story that tell of the, narr the narrator's encounter with Funes. He, Funes, told me that previous to the, to the rainy afternoon when the blue-tinted horse threw him, he had been like any Christian, blind, deaf-mute, somnambulistic, memoryless, I tried to remind him of his precise perception of time, his memory for proper names. He paid no attention to me. For 19 years, he said, he had lived like a person in a dream. He looked without seeing, heard without he hearing, forgot everything, almost everything. On falling from the horse, he lost consciousness. When he recovered it, the present was almost intolerable. It was so rich and bright. The same was true of the most ancient and most trivial memories of his. A little later, he realized that he was crippled. This fact scarcely interested him. He reasoned or felt that immobility was a minimum price to pay. Now his perception and memory were infallible. We, in a glance, perceive three wine glasses on the table. Funes saw all the shoots, clusters, and grapes of the vine. He remembered the shapes of the clouds in the south at dawn on the 30th of April, 1882. He could compare them in his, in his recollection with the marbled grain in the design of a leather-bound book which he had seen only once, and with the lines in the spray which an oar raised in the Rio Negro on the eve of the Battle of Quebracho. These recollections were not simple. Each visual image was linked to muscular sensations, thermal sensations, and so on. He could reconstruct all his dreams, all his fancies. Two or three times he had reconstructed an entire day. He told me, I have more memories in myself alone than all men have had since the world was a world. And again, he said, my dreams are like your vigils. And again, toward dawn, he said, my memory, sir, is like a garbage heap. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Carla Hesse is the Dean of the Social Sciences Division of the College of Letters and Science. Um, she's taught here at Cal for 20 odd years, and the focus of her research has been modern European history, including its social and cultural aspects, with a specialty in modern European women's history. Her scholarship has been widely recognized. She holds the uh, Peter Sather Chair in the Department of History, and in 2007 won the prestigious Abby Warburg Prize. Please welcome Carla. Thank you, Vikram. Well, I, I imagine that people would read their favorite prose fiction uh, today. And um, as a dean of social sciences, I thought it, it compelled me to think of something that was nonfiction or at least um, <clears throat> uh, that might be beautiful. And it, I, it struck me that it's a, an, an appropriate moment to remind ourselves that political philosophy and politics can actually be beautiful. And, and thinking about the theme of beginnings, 
uh, I decided to choose one of my favorite writers, um, the political philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and to read to you from the opening of his Social Contract, which was published in 1762. Uh, one of the striking things about this text for me and revisiting it is not just that I remember the first time I read it, which was as a freshman at UC Santa Cruz, and it was one of those books I read and I left the classroom just with my heart racing with excitement at the kind of revolutionary discovery I had made in reading it, but also because it, I think, suits well the theme of beginnings, in that in many respects this text, I think, has the claim to be the beginning of modern political thought. And I think one of the things that makes it so beautiful is not just that every sentence Rousseau wrote was beautiful, and there are very few, I think, political philosophers we could say that about, uh, and very few writers, in fact, um, even in the 18th century. But I think one of its special qualities is, is that it's written in the first person. And in reading it again today uh, and revisiting it, I realized there must be a moment in which people cease to write political philosophy in the first person. And um, it's something I'm going to conti continue to think about, uh, why, that, why that tradition disappeared. But it gives the text a kind of peculiar intimacy, which is not distant from the fictional world. My purpose is to consider if, in political society, there can be any legitimate and sure principle of government, taking men as they are and laws as they might be. In this inquiry, I shall try always to bring together what right permits with what interest prescribes, so that justice and utility are in no way divided. I start without seeking to prove the importance of my subject. I may be asked whether I am a prince or a legislator that I should be writing about politics. I answer no. And indeed, that is my reason for doing so. If I were a prince or a legislator, I should not waste my time saying what ought to be done. I should do it or keep silent. Born as I was, the citizen of a free state and a member of its sovereign body, the very right to vote imposes on me the duty to instruct myself in public affairs, however little influence my voice may have in them. And whenever I reflect upon governments, I am happy to find that my studies always give me fresh reasons for admiring that of my own country. Man was born free, and he is everywhere in chains. Those who think themselves the masters of others are indeed greater slaves than they. How did this transformation come about? I do not know. How can it be made legitimate? That is the question I believe I can answer. If I were to consider only force and the effects of force, I should say, so long as a people is constrained to obey, and obey it does well. But as soon as it can shake off the yoke and shakes it off, it does better. For since it regains its freedom by the same right as that which removed it, a people is either justified in taking back its freedom, or there is no justifying those who took it away. But the social order is a sacred right, which serves as a basis for all other rights. And it is not a natural right. It is one that must be founded on covenants. The oldest of all societies, and the only natural one, is that of the family. Yet children remain tied to their parent by nature only so long as they need the parent for their preservation. As soon as this need ends, the natural bond is dissolved. Once the children are freed from the obedience they owe their parent, and the parent is freed from his or her responsibilities toward them, both parties regain equally their independence. If they continue to remain united, it is no longer by nature, but by their own choice, which unites them. And the family as such is kept in being only by agreement. That this common liberty is a consequence of man's nature. Man's first law is to watch over his own preservation, his first care his own, he owes to himself, and as soon as he reaches the age of reason, he becomes the only judge of the best means to preserve himself 
he becomes his own master. Aristotle said that men were not at all equal by nature, since some were born for slavery and others born to be masters. Aristotle was right, but he mistook the effect for the cause. Anyone born in slavery is born for slavery. Nothing is more certain. Slaves in their bondage lose everything, even the desire to be free. But the strongest man is never strong enough to be the master of all time, unless he transforms force into right and obedience into duty. Hence, the right of the strongest, a right, in quotations, that sounds like something intended ironically, hence in quotations, but is actually laid down as a principle. But ne shall we never see, but shall we never see this phrase explained? Force is a physical power. I do not see how its effects could produce morality. To yield to force is an act of necessity, not of will. It is at best an act of prudence. In what sense can it be seen as a moral duty? Let us grant for a moment that this so-called right exists. I suggest it can only produce a tissue of be bewildering nonsense. For once might is made to be a right, effect and cause are reversed. And every force which overcomes another force inherits the right which belonged to the vanquished. As soon as a man can disobey with impunity, his disobedience becomes legitimate. And as the strongest are always right, the only problem is how to become the strongest. But what can be the validity of a right which perishes, perishes with the force on which it rests? If force compels obedience, there is no need to invoke a duty to obey. And if force ceases to compel obedience, there is no longer any obligation. Thus, the word right adds nothing to what is said by force. It is meaningless. Obey those in power. If this means yield to force, the precept is sound, but superfluous. It will never, I suggest, be violated. All power comes from God, I agree, but so does every disease, and no one forbids us to summon a physician. If I am held up by a robber at the edge of a wood, force compels me to hand over my purse. But if I could somehow contrive to keep the purse from him, would I still be obliged in conscience to surrender it? After all, the pistol in the robber's hand is undoubtedly a power. Surely it must be admitted then that might does not make right, and that the duty of obedience is owed only to legitimate powers. Thus we are constantly led back to my original question. Since no man has any natural authority over his fellows, and since force alone bestows no right, all legitimate authority among men must be based on covenants. Thank you. Thank you. Very necessary reading in, in our times right now. Um, Fei Mai Ning is another Cal grad. Uh, she's currently a lecturer in the Department of Ethnic uh, Studies, uh, where she works on Chinese American literature and teaches it. But I know her as a creator of fiction. Her first novel, Bone, was published in 1994 and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Fiction Award. Her second novel, Steer Toward Rock, followed in 2008 and won an American Book Award. She's also won many other honors, including the Rome Prize and the Lila Wallace Writers Award. Please welcome Faye. Thank you. What a warm welcome. I am very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to read from this book, Narrow Road to the Deep North, A Journey into the Interior of Alaska by Catherine McNamara. What I love about this beginning is that it asks a question, and the question is the writer's goal in travel. Catherine McNamara writes, I wanted to learn how to tell a story and tell truth. And I'm inspired by this because I feel this is a question for any journey in life, that we arrive, that we 
are welcomed, that we observe, and that we are sometimes inspired to retell, and always with respect. So let me begin. This section starts out opening. One winter, I was visiting in a, small call, in a small village on the edge of Southwest Alaska. This was during a month of short days, sharp with cold and iron black, starry nights. For a, companion, for a companionable supper, I was walking from the school where I was lodged to the teacher's house. The trail I followed lay to one side of the village, a community of families in 30 or so houses with caches and outhouses built low to the ground. Here and there, oil lamps glowed through small paned windows. The dogs had been fed and were quiet. A light wind carried away the mumble of the generator. There was no sound but the huh of my breath and squeak of my boots on the snow. The village slipped behind my right shoulder. The blackness grew denser. From the heavens, the great bear pointed down to a point, to a spot not far off. Orion, the hunter, strode along in his path. I lifted my hand in salute and in measure. Where it reached the height of my shoulder, the land ended. From there, Orion rose. My hand arced above my head, so much of the sky he filled. Between us stood nothing taller than I. The village turned in on itself, tested at my, tested at my back. I was not from that place, only passing through. But just then, I also was part of it. I walked on, watching Orion, my heart rising, the cold, its abstracting touch, braced the uncovered part of my face. I was walking beside Orion. The space between us was not empty, and through it, I cleared a path that fitted my body exactly. In my mind's eye, I see that night again. Now I see myself also. I see a human who is in proportion to the trail. I see the small village the trail is part of, the tundra they all sit upon, the great circle of the horizon, the vast inverted bowl of the night sky, and Orion, the hunter. Orion is walking endlessly, as he has done since he has made his own trail. The village is the house of the body of people who have belonged to this place since their distant beginning. I am passing between school and teacher's house, buildings recently made, inhabited by people who come from the outside and who sooner or later leave. Only for that moment am I there. Around my body, the stars turn in their epic cycles. The people move surely in their seasoned rounds. The uneasy teachers sit for a while at the edge of town, and I live in that moment with Orion. That is how I see, too, what follows in this book, in proportion. Here are these great and lesser cycles in their brief and recurring coincidences. Here are these, here are, here are, arc the people and animals and spirits of that place. Here are those who pass by at a tangent. Here is a trail on which all converge for a moment. I am a human in proportion to that hand and beautiful, I am a human in proportion to that hard and beautiful night. All around me are the unending, lively, powerful beings of a full world whose story I have entered for a while. Once I listened as a well-respected woman, an elder, and it was said, a woman of power addressed a group of young women. Long time ago, they told us stories, she said, so we could learn how to become people. I will tell you what was told to me, and I will tell you 
what I saw there at that time. And I'll just end with the beginning of the next section. It's called Something We Do Not Know. I wanted to learn this, how I could tell a story and tell truth. These two virtues seemed in my life to be at odds with one another. I did not believe they ought to be at odds, however, and, look, and, and went looking for what else I needed to know. But traveling has its own fascinations, and I love them. The few small cases you fit your belongings into, the curious people and the knowing people who talk to you, the people who become your friends, cities and mountains, places where the air is so pure, you can no longer be sure what you are seeing. From Paris, where my worldly education had begun, I went to Alaska, January 1976, a cold winter. I thought Alaska would be a snow-covered, silent land. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Uh, our last reader tonight is Ananya Roy, who is a professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning. Uh, she is the Education Director of the Blum Center of Developing Economies and the Co-Director of the Global Metropolitan Studies Center. She's very busy. Um, she, she's the author and editor of numerous books, um, most recently being Poverty Capital, Microfinance, and the Making of Development. Uh, she's won the Distinguished Teaching Award, uh, which is the top teaching award given here at Berkeley, and also the Golden Apple Teaching Award, which is the only teaching award given by the student body. In 2009, she was named the California Professor of the Year by the Case Carnegie Foundation. Please welcome Ananya. Good evening, I'm thrilled to be here and I thank Vikram for the invitation. I will read to you this evening from V.S. Naipaul's 1961 novel, A House for Mr. Biswas. Naipaul is perhaps a controversial choice for a favorite beginning. His views on a range of topics, from Islam to women, remain under scrutiny. In a scathing but poetic critique, Edward Said famously described Naipaul as a witness for the Western prosecution. Said writes, on the basis of being a Trinidadian, Naipaul has had ascribed to him the credentials of a man who can serve as witness for the third world. And he's a very convenient witness. He is a third worlder denouncing his own people, not because they're victims of imperialism, but because they seem to have an innate flaw, which is that they're not white. But I have chosen to read from Naipaul today for precisely these reasons, because for me, he is an embodiment of the anxieties of post-colonial existence. Thus, in awarding him the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2001, the prize committee noted that Naipaul is Conrad's heir as the analyst of the destinies of empires in the moral sense, what they do to human beings. A House for Mr. Biswas is such an annal of empire told from the periphery, but without any of the moral certitude that narratives off and from the margins often bear. As a student of space and spatial politics, I've always been drawn to the theme of home and house that is at the heart of this book. This is a novel about finding a home in the world. Homi Baba thus notes that it is in the ruins of the Biswas bungalows that he found his own corner in the world of letters, a post-colonial place. But the book is also about the distinctive enterprise of house as home, and of house as home as a marker of middle class identity. So in all of the parts of the world in which I do research, in India, in Egypt, I see Mr. Biswas everywhere. He is uncannily familiar. So here are a few excerpts from the prologue, A House for Mr. Biswas. 10 weeks before he died, Mr. Mohan Biswas, a journalist of Sikkim Street, St. James, Port of Spain, was sacked. He had been ill for some time. In less than a year, he had spent more than nine weeks at the colonial hospital and convalesced at home for even longer. 
When the doctor advised him to take a complete rest, the Trinidad Sentinel had no choice. It gave Mr. Biswas three months' notice and continued up to the time of his death to supply him every morning with a free copy of the paper. Mr. Biswas was 46 and had four children. He had no money. His wife, Shama, had no money. On the house in Sikkim Street, Mr. Biswas owed and had been owing for four years $3,000. The interest on this at 8% came to $20 a month. The ground rent was $10. Two children were at school. The two older children, on whom Mr. Biswas might have depended, were both abroad on scholarships. But he thought of the house as his own, though for years it had been irretrievably mortgaged. And during these months of illness and despair, he was struck again and again by the wonder of being in his own house, the audacity of it, to walk in through his own front gate, to bar entry to whoever he wished, to close his doors and windows every night, to hear no noises except those of his family, to wander freely from room to room and about his yard, instead of being condemned, as before, to retire the moment he got home in the crowded rooms of one or the other of Mrs. Tulsi's houses, crowded with Shama's sisters, their husbands, their children. As a boy, he had moved from one house of strangers to another. And since his marriage, he felt he had lived nowhere but in the houses of the Tulsis, at Hanuman House in Arwakas, in the decaying wooden house at Short Hills, in the clumsy concrete house in Port of Spain. And now at the end, he found himself in his own house, on his own half lot of land, his own portion of the earth. That he should have been responsible for this seemed to him in these last months stupendous. The very day the house was bought, they began to see flaws in it. The staircase was dangerous, the upper floor sagged, there was no back door, most of the windows didn't close. But it was astonishing how quickly this disappointment had faded, how quickly they had accommodated themselves to every peculiarity and awkwardness of the house. And once that had happened, their eyes ceased to be critical, and the house simply became their house. He could not quite believe that he had made that world. He could not see why he should have a place in it. And everything by which he was surrounded was examined and rediscovered with pleasure, surprise, disbelief, every relationship, every possession. The kitchen safe. That was more than 20 years old. Shortly after his marriage, he had bought it, white and new, from the carpenter at Arwakas, the netting unpainted, the wood still odorous. Then, and for some time afterwards, sawdust stuck to your hand when you passed it along the shelves. How often he had stained and varnished it, and painted it too. Patches of the netting were clogged, and varnish and paint had made a thick, uneven skin on the woodwork. And in what colors he had painted it, blue and green and even black. In 1938, the week the Pope died and the Sentinel came out with a black border, he had come across a large tin of yellow paint and painted everything yellow, even the typewriter. That he had acquired when at the age of 33, he had decided to become rich by writing for American and English magazines. A brief, happy, hopeful period. The typewriter had remained idle and yellow, and in its color had long since ceased to, to startle. And the dining table, bought cheaply from a deserving destitute, who had got some money from the Sentinel's deserving dis destitutes fund and wished to show his gratitude to Mr. Biswas, who ran that fund. And the glass cabinet bought to please Shama, still dainty and practically empty. But bigger than them all was this house, his house. How terrible it would have been 
at this time to be without it, to have died among the Tulsis amid the squalor of that large, disintegrating and indifferent family, to have left Shama and the children among them in one room. Worse, to have lived without even attempting to lay claim to one's portion of the earth to have lived and died as one had been born, unnecessary and unaccommodated.